Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody uh, out there. This is Andy Forsetto, and I'm uh, talking from the IRIS headquarters office in Washington, D.C. Uh, you've come to the latest in the IRIS webinar series that we've been running here. Today's webinar speaker is going to be uh, Weeson Shen from the University of Colorado Boulder, who will be talking about his PhD uh, research. And uh, just uh, as an introduction, I want to make sure that uh, everybody knows uh, how these generally work if this is your first time here. So uh, what we'll do is uh, I'll introduce Weeson. He'll talk for uh, typical colloquium talk length. And as questions come up during the talk, uh, what you can do is enter them into the control panel for the webinar. There's a little panel that says questions. Uh, if you just type in uh, a very, uh, for my benefit, a very clearly worded question, then I will be able to uh, relay those to Weeson at the end of the webinar. And uh, we can, uh, it's not like we have to leave the room at a certain time. So uh, please feel free to um, ask as many questions as you like. So uh, with that in mind, uh, one thing I wanted to do before we start is just uh, show the uh, current webinar page. So if, uh, if you like this and uh, you want to look at some past webinars, they're all archived here. Uh, and so these are links that go to the uh, YouTube account. And Weeson's will show up here at the top of the page uh, probably tomorrow and at the latest on Monday. So uh, this is a running archive for these uh, webinars. So uh, without further ado, uh, I want to introduce our speaker today, Weeson Chen. Weeson's a PhD student at the University of Colorado in Boulder, uh, and he'll be talking to us today about using surface waves and receiver functions to better understand the North American continent. So, uh, Weeson, I'll hand it off to you. Okay, thanks, Sandy. And changing presenter to... There you go. Okay. Uh, okay, so I hope everybody can see my screen here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Mm, this is Wayson Shen, broadcasting from Boulder, Colorado. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a 3D model of the crust and uppermost mantle for Western and Central U.S. Uh, by the joint interpretation of receiver functions and the surface wave dispersion. Uh, this work is uh, supervised by my advisor, Professor Michael Reisboler, and it's a result of collaboration with Vera Shoti Pelcom from University of Colorado and uh, Feng Xi Lin from Caltech. Mm. This work is mainly done on the presence of Earth scope US array. So, what you can see here is a map of current US array station, st stations. And now it's uh, in here near the region of Chicago. Uh, what I have done is I have processed the data west of this line to the west coast of uh, America. And uh, here is a plot of the latest uh, radio wave face, face velocity maps and 28 seconds. Uh, today my talk will be divided into three parts. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce the data processing and the methodology, uh, which is mainly surface wave and receiver function processing, and the Monte Carlo joint inversion method. And then I'm going to uh, present uh, the example result, which is a 3D model of the Western US. And last, I'm going to show you a first glance of the structure beneath the middle part of the US, which, which is a middle continental rift zone, which you can see here. Uh, now moving to the first part. I divided the first part into three sections. First, I'm going to introduce you the surface wave processing. Uh, okay. So surface wave is a seismic uh, wave that uh, propagates and the surface of Earth. Uh, in comparison with body wave, body wave samples deeper parts of Earth and the surface wave only samples uh, the crust and upper mantle of the Earth. Here you see the seismic record 
the surface wave shows a very large amplitude here. Usually, uh, we categorize surface wave into two types. One is lava wave, which has particle motion uh, horizontally, and another type is radio wave, which has particle motion in a vertical plane. My work is mainly on the radio wave part, which is the the wave then has particle motion in the vertical plane. There is a very famous phenomenon for surface wave, which is dispersion. What you see here is a surface wave record. And if we do, do a band pass for this record at the different periods, you can see the arrival time of this signal is different for different periods. We call this dispersion. And if we you can measure this dispersion, you can see uh, if you can measure the velocity of different periods of wave, we can plot the dispersion curve here. It's a speed, surface wave speed, and the function as a period. And uh, theory has proved that uh, for different periods of surface, surface wave, it is sensitive to the shear wave structure at the different depth. Uh, which means uh, it gives us the depth resolution of the uh, Earth structure. Here you see the 50, the 50 second surface wave has a sensitivity much shallower than the 125 second sur surface wave. By using those information, we can we can construct a model as a function of depths from the surface wave dispersion. Uh, how do we construct the surface wave dis dispersion? We usually we construct this curve from the surface wave tomography maps. For example, uh, if you see here, it's a set of tomography surface wave tomography maps from, for example, eight seconds to eighty seconds. If we take the surface wave speed and one location, for example, R eleven A and the base center range and take all the measurements from those different maps, we can construct this surface, local surface wave dispersion curve for this point. And in my study, I, I used the surface wave tomography maps from eight seconds to 80 seconds. Uh, in a shorter period from eight to 40 seconds, I perform ambient noise Icono tomography to construct those maps. And at the longer periods, for example, from 25 to 80 seconds, I construct those maps from Tennyseismic Heimholtz tomography. Uh, here, those maps I show here is 8 seconds and 30 seconds from ambient noise tomography, and 80, 30 seconds, 50 seconds, and 80 seconds from Tennyseismic tomography. And this histogram shows you the difference of 30 seconds phase velocity map from ambient noise and 30 seconds phase velocity map from earthquake. Uh, the difference is very small. The, for, this is another comparison. This is the difference of those two maps and the 28 seconds. You can see some features, the differing amplitude, and there are some edge effect uh, in ambient noise map, because in ambient noise we don't have full back azimuth coverage. Usually the difference uh, lies within the uncertainties, except near the uh, edge of the map. For details of the icon tomography, please refer to uh, Fan Xining's GGI paper in 20, uh, 2009 and 2011. Once we get the, those maps, we can construct the local dispersion curve for any points in this map. Uh, and then we can use those dispersion information to, do, to construct a VS model. However, in, in surface wave inversion, we face, some, uh, we face some problem. For example, the surface wave uh, dispersion is only sensitive to the average velocity and some depths. So it, uh, it suffers from a lot of vertical trade-off. 
uh, includes velocity velocity trader and the velocity depth trader. Here I'm the depth I mean crystal or moho depth. Uh, you see here the transect from I from the basin range to great plains. I make the surface wave dispersion for this transect and then do an inversion uh, for this transect. On the left side it's an inversion of the surface wave uh, but I give some constraint to this inversion. I impose a positive gradient and the uppermost mantle. So in this model you can see there is low velocity zone and the uppermost mantle. And on the right, right side uh, I impose a negative gradient and the uppermost mantle. Uh, both models they will show uh, they will fit my surface wave dispersion curve very well, uh, which means my surface wave data can cannot distinguish uh, one one from another one. Uh, how to solve this this kind of trade off? Mm, we have to introduce other se seismic data. Uh, so here I'm going to introduce receiver functions, uh, which is sensitive to crust thickness and will solve some of the trade off. So I'm going to talk about some receiver function processing. Uh, as a lot of you have known that the receiver function is a waveform computed, computed from tiny seismic body wave uh, and it's sensitive to the velocity discontinuities beneath the receiver. Uh, for example, the moho discontinuity or the base of the sedimentary layer and it's very complementary with the surf surface wave, which is only sensitive to average velocity. Uh, here I will show you how I process our receiver function data. Uh, for example, what you see here in the middle in panel A, it's a receiver function recorded at the station R11A at the basin range. I plot those receiver functions as a function of bank azimuth earthquakes uh, then generates the receiver function uh, locates at almost every bank at the month. And what, what you can see here is the receiver functions they, they are different from one bank at the month to another one. For example, you can see a signal at about two seconds from the animals of 120 degrees, but it's not there and the animals of 140 degrees. So to to solve this problem, I I use a harmonic stripping technique uh, to remove the signal that is not shown in every bank animals. For example, if I take the amplitude of the receiver function and six seconds and plot it as red dots here in Figure B, you can see it varies uh, with directions, and then I fit this variation with a harmonic function which contains three parts A0, A1, and A2. Uh, I fit it with this function which you can see the blue curve here. And then I only take the A0 component which does not depend on the direction and the amplitude for this time point. Then I do this harmonic stripping for every time point then I can get the A0 component of receiver function from 0 seconds to 10 seconds. Uh, this plot shows uh, more details. For example, here you see the raw receiver functions in picture A. And uh, the A0 component is shown in picture D. They are all identical uh, from different directions. And A1, A2 contains the variation that has uh, 360 degrees period and the 180 degree degrees period. And the combination of A0, A1, A, and A2 is plotted here in figure B, which I call it H. It captures most of the variations in our raw, raw receiver functions. And if I take the difference between the raw receiver function and the H, I can get the the random noise part or the signal that cannot be 
fitted by A, A0, A1, A2 component. It's plotted in C. And I use the average amplitude of C to define the uncertainty of my surface wave, uh, I'm sorry, receiver functions waveform. So you can see the uncertainty is shown here, which is a gray corridor. Uh, when I get the average receiver function for each station, and as I mentioned, we can get the local surface wave dispersion for each station. We can jointly interpret them. The combination of surface wave and receiver function is not a new idea. Uh, it has been introduced to seismology for a long time. Uh, and there are a lot of people who have done similar work. Uh, however, there are some limitations in the prior researches that combine the two data. For example, traditionally, surface wave has much lower resolution than receiver functions. Uh, usually, if you look at the global surface wave map, its resolution is uh, over 100 kilometers, and the receiver function is only sensitive to very local structure. And also, traditionally, we only construct surface wave maps from uh, by using tenisseismic data, which means we can only get relatively longer periods, I mean, longer than 25 seconds, usually. So it's mainly sensitive to mantle structure, but not sensitive to crustal structure. And the third one is uncertainties. They are not, usually they are not measured in the either surface wave data or receiver functions data. And uh, finally, uncertainties, they are not traced into the models. To tackle those problems, uh, for example, to, uh, to solve the first one, I use, uh, thanks to US array, it's a very wonderful array. Uh, from the array, we can generate very high resolution surface wave maps. Uh, it's, uh, it will be comparable to the receiver function resolution. Uh, and to tackle the second one, we apply the ambient noise tomography method to construct uh, surface wave dispersion from uh, less than 25 seconds. And to tackle the third one, uh, I use the latest Icano or Heimholtz tomography to do the surface wave inversion. Uh, it will give me the uncertainty information of the surface wave dispersion. And uh, I use a harmonic stripping technique to obtain the receiver function uncertainties. And to tackle the fourth one, we use a Markov chain Monte Carlo inversion algorithm to to transfer the uncertainty in the data to the uncertainties in our resulting model. So now I'm going to introduce the Monte Carlo inversion. Before I talk about the details of inversion, I, I want to introduce the model space or model parameterization. Every inversion is based on some model parameterization. Usually people use fine layers, for example, every one kilometers we use a layer to to uh, represent our model. But here I didn't use fine layers. I divided my, mo my model into three major layers. The first one is a sedimentary layer. It is uh, parameterized by two parameters. Uh, one is VSV at the top, another one is VSV at the bottom of the layer. And the, between the two, between the upper bound and the lower bound, it is uh, it is a gradient layer. So the velocity is linearly increasing in this layer. And uh, the second layer is crystalline crust. I parameterize this layer with four cubic piece blinds. And the third one is the uh, uppermost mantle layer. I use five piece blinds to represent it. And uh, uh, between those layers, there are two discontinuities. One is bottom of sediment. Another one is the moho discontinuity. And uh, I allow the depths of those two discontinuities to change. So totally, I will have 13 parameters. Uh, this is a very small amount of parameters compared with uh, fine layers. So I can do the Monte Carlo searching very fast. And by using B cubic B splines, I can remove the prior smoothing factor. Usually, it is 
used in fine layer parameterization. And uh, I don't have to introduce thin VSV anomalies in my result. Sometimes it's good, but sometimes it's not good because uh, uh, this model parameterization is cannot represent the real Earth. Sometimes real Earth re requires fine layers, and my model parameterization cannot handle that. Uh, once we have our model parameterization, and uh, I take some input model, for example, I take the class 2 and some global model for the mantle, and I perturb this. First, I, I, I reparameterize this input model, and then perturb this model, for example, 20% to generate a model space. And I will work, on, work in this model space to find out uh, good models that fit my data. And the Markov chain Monte Carlo inversion is uh, applied in this way. First, I randomly select a starting point in this model space. I do the forward calculation, uh, which is I compute the reserve function and the surface rate. And then I compute the misfit between the synthetic data and the observed data. I transfer the misfit function into the likelihood function, uh, which is shown here. And uh, once this is done, I randomly pick another neighboring point here. For example, this is a new model. I then compute the likelihood function for this new model. Oops. Uh, and then I compare their likelihood function. Uh, if this new model shows a better fit, I will accept it. And, uh, and uh, I will find another new model uh, nearby this model. By guiding this, uh, this is so-called the Metropolis law. By uh, guided by this Metropolis law, I can search in my model space, and finally I will get a, a set of models that will fit my data. Uh, besides those, uh, besides those likelihood function constraint, I also impose some prior constraint. For example. I force my VSV model is monotonically increasing in the sediments or in the crystalline crust. Uh, I also force the jump and the discontinuity. For example, at Moho, it should be positive. I mean, the velocity should increase and the discontinuities. Uh, once those prior information is constrained, I need to see how they affect my prior distribution. Prior, dis prior distribution is uh, is the information I added to my uh, model parameters. For example, I show you six uh, histograms here. Uh, there are prior distribution for sediment thickness, crust thickness, or VSV contrast across moho, or VSV and different depths. You can see by introducing those uh, those prior constraint, my Sediment thickness or crust thickness is a still random distribution. Rather, it reshaped my velocities at the different depths, making them more Gaussian, more centered, and some depth range. Uh, and this is a distribution only guided by my prior constraint. If I add the data to my inversion, which means my Monte Carlo uh, search is guided by both prior constraint and uh, my data. For example, if I only throw in my surface wave data to my Monte Carlo search, uh, you can see the posterior distribution, which is a uh, distribution of model parameters after the inversion, and uh, it's shown as red histograms here. They are plotted uh, with comparison with the prior distribution, which is white histograms here. You can see some parameters, for example, VSV and the 10 kilometer steps, or VSV and the 120 kilometer steps, is, uh, is centered to some value. Uh, this means our surface wave data tells us the information of those two parameters. 
And some parameters, their distribution does not change a lot. For example, the crustal thickness, uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, preferring any particular crustal thickness. This means our surface wave data cannot tell us the information of uh, crustal, uh, of the moho thickness, uh, depths or crustal thickness. The same thing to the sediment thickness. However, once I add another data, which is receiver function to my inversion, those distribution is improved a lot, especially the crustal thickness. Uh, for this point, R11A in baseline range, its crustal thickness is center about 22 kilometers. And uh, the VSV and the lower crust is also improved because once we improve uh, once we can determine our crustal thickness better, uh, we can determine our lower crustal velocity better, as well as the velocity contrast uh, across MOHO, which is plotted in figure E. This means the trade-off that is shown up in surface wave inversion is reduced a lot when we introduce the reserve function data. So next figure, I'm going to show you how the model is improved. Here is the distribution of each model parameter. If I take the average value of velocity and every depth, I can construct the average model and the function of depths. You can see the in figure B on the left, the blank line shows the average model. And uh, from those distribution, I can also compute the one sigma wave which is shown here as red, red lines. And also the full uh, distribution of the model is shown as gray corridor here. The crustal thickness for this point is shown as a dashed line. The left side is uh, the inversion result from surface wave data. You can see the uncertainty is relatively large uh, and the depths of cross of moho and uh, the fit to surface wave dispersion data is very well but the fit to receiver function is not very good because we don't add the receiver function to our inversion and on the right side it's a result from the joint inversion you can see compared with the left panel the uncertainty range is reduced a lot especially at the depths near moho and the moho thickness is better determined and we reduce a lot of uncertainty and the lower crust the uppermost mantle which means a lot of trade-off is reduced and on the right side it's a fit to receiver function data in panel C and a fit to dispersion data in B because they both data fit very well this is a station R11A in basin range. I'm going to show you some other uh, points. Uh, here on the left side is T18A in Colorado Plateau. You can see the data, the receiver function data is plotted with uh, blank lines. The data is very flat. We don't see a very clear moho uh, signal here. So our resulting model does not show a clear moho discontinuity. Instead of that, the moho is a very gradient and the lower crust velocity is faster and the uppermost metal velocity is, is relatively slow. Another station here is O25A in Great Plains. Actually, it's, a, it's a Denver Basin. So you can see the receiver function of this station. Uh, it is dominated by the uh, by the reverberations from the sedimentary layer. And the joint, the joint inversion, the Monte Carlo inversion allows us to fit this receiver function by introducing a gradient thick sediments layer. And the moho is a little bit late, is later than six seconds. So the crust thickness, average crust thickness is thick, is about 50 kilometers. And the dispersion curve is fit very well. 
uh, as I mentioned, the trade-off could be reduced a lot. So here I show you how we reduce the trade-off. Uh, still the same transect from basin range to green plane, great plains. You can see on the left and the middle panel it's the uh, surface wave uh, inversion result, and we cannot distinguish them. However, however, when I introduce the receiver functions, we can see the joint inversion result is shown in panel C. Beneath the basin range, the receiver function prefers a large velocity contrast across models. So you can see the model here is more similar to model B. And beneath the crowd planes, the receiver function prefers a slower uppermost mantle, so it to be more similar to model A. Basically, this is a combination of the model A and B, but we constructed according to our data rather than ad hoc uh, prior constraints. So this is the introduction of the methodology. And uh, we, once we develop this methodology, we apply it to uh, the US array stations. And here I'm going to show you some example results. For example, here I show you a map of the velocity at 120 kilometer steps. Uh, it's the average speed uh, and these steps for each station is plotted as a mosaic uh, in figure A. And once we get those measurements, we can crank it into a smooth map, in, which is shown on the left right side, which is figure B. We can we can do this cringing at every diff, every depth from surface to 150 kilometers. So by using this method, we can construct a 3D model. This is a, this is a plot for 3D model in 120. And uh, here I show you three other depths. On the left side, it's zero to eight kilometers, average velocity between zero to eight kilometers. And this is uh, very sensitive to the distribution of the uh, large sedimentary basin. You can, you, can, uh, you can see the Denver Basin or the Great Valley, you can see clearly here on this map. And uh, you see in the middle, it's a plot for lo lower crust. Uh, in, in this region, you can see beneath basin range, the lower crust velocity is very low. And, uh, also, the beneath the Rocky Mountains, it's, it's very low. And uh, on the right side, it's uh, velocity and 60 kilometers depth. So it's mainly the velocity and uh, uppermost mantle uh, right beneath the Moho for some region. And you can see the Beneath the Snake River Plain, we, we see very low velocity. And it extends to the uh, Yellowstone. Except those velocities and depths, we can also determine the crust thickness for this region. Here I show you the crust thickness map. And uh, you can see the crust is very thin beneath basin range. It's the thickest at the uh, crowd of Rocky Mountains. Another good thing of the Monte Carlo inversion is we are not just to determine the uh, best value best of the each parameter. We can also determine the uncer uncertainties of each parameter. You can see this is the uncertainty of crust thickness from joint inversion. In most of the region where we see a clear moho, for example, based on a range, we can low can make the crust thickness uncertainty as low as two kilometers. And in some region, if we cannot determine the crust thickness very well, for example, the crust plateau, uh, the uncertainty is relatively larger. Uh, this uncertainty is uh, pro improved a lot compared if we only use the surface wave data to do the inversion. Now I show you the comparison of the uncertainty of surface wave inversion and uh, the joint inversion. 
uh, in Mosul region, region, it, it is reduced by at least uh, 50%. And uh, here I show you another uh, parameter we can determine from our inversion. This is the velocity contrast across mode, which is defined as the velocity difference between the uppermost mantle and the lower crust. You can see in some region, if there is no clear Mohu signal, uh, this value is very small. The velocity contrast is uh, as small as 0.2 to 0.3 kilometers per second. And here I'm showing you some more transects, vertical transect of this model. Uh, for example, I, the vertical transect along BB prime, it's a transect uh, through the Snake River plain. You can see how the low velocity zone migrates uh, uh, to shallower depths when it approaches Yellowstone. And uh, in transect CC prime, you can see the clear subduction and the low velocity zone and the uppermost mantle. And the transect DD prime, you can see there's a mantle drift here beneath the Shinko Valley, uh, right near the Sierra Nevada. Uh, so basically, from the joint inversion, uh, we can construct a very high resolution, uh, high resolution model across the uppermost metal for this region. The high resolution, I mean both vertical resolution as well as uh, horizontal resolution. Uh, as a third part, I'm going to talk about some fresh result uh, we recently processed for the middle US region, uh, especially the middle continental rift zone. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, structure here. Uh, here I show you the gravity alumni uh, in the middle part of the US. You can see this is uh, Minnesota and uh, here is Iowa. You can see there's a gravity high alumni along the so-called middle, continu middle continent rift zone. And uh, when we process our ambient noise tomography and earthquake tomography in, in this region, you can see some anomalies along this uh, rift zone. The first panel is the free air gravity anomaly. And uh, the other three pictures, they are uh, ambient noise tomography and 10 seconds, and the ambient, ambient noise tomography and 28 seconds and uh, the earthquake tomography and 40 seconds. You can see in 28 seconds, a low velocity region is uh, showing up along the rift zone. And uh, if you look at the two station, uh, H35A and H37A, one station is near the rift and one station is further away from the rift. You can see the for the station near nearer the rift, the velocity, the shear wave or the uh, surface wave face velocity is slower than the H seventy H thirty five A. Another pair is M thirty six A and N thirty eight A. We can see the velocity is uh, is lower for the station within the rift. And it's slow, mainly uh, into the between 20 and 40 seconds, uh, which we think is uh, into and the 20 to 50 kilometers days. And if you look at the receiver function in this region, it's, all, it's also interesting because here I show you the receiver function profile along the rift uh, from north which is C38A to South P33A. Those receiver functions shows, they don't show clear moho actually, uh, except some stations, they show some moho, but in a lot of receiver functions, they don't show a clear moho signal. And uh, even some stations, for example, H37A, 
it shows a clear double peak in a receiver function. For comparison, I plot the receiver function for H35A here. Uh, you can see our H35A is very flat. It means the mohawk might be not very clear there. And then I apply my joint inversion uh, in this region for these two stations. For example, for H35A, you can see the moho is gradient. And for H37A, uh, there's a very clear moho discontinuity, which fits the receiver function at six seconds. However, due to our very simple model parameterization, we are not uh, able to determine uh, what caused this wiggle at about four seconds. Uh, if we make clear, more detailed comparison between these two models, we can see that at H37A, the velocity at the lower crust is uh, slower than the velocity at the lower crust beneath H35A. And we think for those two stations, this slower lower crust might cause the observed uh, slower velocity uh, at 28 seconds. However, this is just a comparison for two stations. And uh, if we want to fit the double signal in the receiver function, we might have to introduce another discontinuity within the crust. Mm. I haven't done this work, but presumably we can do that, see if it fits our data. And uh, actually this model demonstrates that our model parameterization is not perfect everywhere. In a lot of regions we have to we have to modify our model parameterization to fit a more complicated data. And uh, here I show you several figures for the 3D model. Uh, we apply the joint inversion uh, for this whole area and I plot the velocity and the 15 kilometer steps and the velocity and the 35 kilometer steps and the crust of thickness and the velocity and the 100 kilometer steps here. You can see in the uppermost metal the velocity shows smaller uh, variation compared with the crust of variation and in the crust uh, especially in the shallow crust, you can see the low velocity zone is concentrated. Uh, the joint region of the northern and the southern part of the rift. However, at 35 kilometers, the low velocity zone is concentrated uh, right beneath the rift zone. Maybe it's, it broadens somehow. And the crust of thickness map shows Beneath the rift, we observe some thicker crust. And uh, outside the rift, especially here, the eastern side of the rift, we observe some very uh, thin crust. It's as shallow as less than 40 kilometers. And we are still working hard uh, to, to present better model for this region, as you as you can see, the receiver function, the complicated receiver function here, really requires some better model parameterization. And uh, we are still looking for answers to explain the, to explain the observed uh, surface wave maps. And overall, uh, I, I tell something about how we produce our surface wave maps, how we process our receiver functions, uh, how we apply the Monte Carlo inversion to our data. And uh, here I present a 3D model for cross the uppermost mantle for, uh, for the Western US. And I show you some first glance of the structure beneath mid continental rift. Uh, this model could be used in a lot of ways. For example, it can be used as a starting, mo starting model for body wave tomography. And uh, it can be used for geodynamic study. For example, here I show you a 
my colleague Will Lewandowski from University of Colorado, how he used my model. He took my velocity model and uh, converted it into density model. And he used this density model to study the buoyancy force from crust and also from mantle. And also he can compute the GPE, which is gravitational potential energy for this region. And, uh, and we think this model can be used uh, in other study as well. Uh, and the description of the model can be found in this link. And uh, our models, uh, actually our pr prior models, uh, uh, 3D models can be found here in this link. And uh, thanks to a lot of people who helped us uh, to accomplish this 3D model, and we are still working hard to tracking the to track the US array. Uh, we are trying to construct a 3D model for the uh, for the whole US. And uh, I think this is uh, material I want to present here. And uh, thanks for hearing. And if you have any questions, uh, please let me know. Okay. So Andy. Thanks a lot, Hi, Winston. Andy. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, I just so... wanted, I can't unmute everybody. So I just wanted you to hear clapping. Uh, that was okay. a great, okay. that was a great talk. Very interesting. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Uh, thank you. So mm -hmm. I have a few questions compiled that have been submitted by uh, people in the webinar already. I would encourage everyone else out there, if you have questions, uh, please take the opportunity to type them into the box as I uh, review the ones that I've got so far. So uh, if that works for you, Wiesen, I'll just start going through the ones that I have. Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the first one was from, uh, it was just a, a very brief technical question from Jing Zhu. Pretty early in the talk, uh, Jing was curious if you could explain a little bit about what cubic B splines is. Oh, I see. Uh, so, cubic B spline is some smooth functions. Uh, so here, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't plot the uh, exact cubic B splines here. It's it's like uh, it's like a for real function. It's a very smooth functions, and uh, uh, by using those cubic B splines, I can. I can construct a smooth velocity profile for depth. And uh, you can view it as some basic functions uh, I use to parameterize my model. I don't okay. know if I answer his question. Uh, okay, great. Uh, Joseph Burns had a question about uh, how you're approaching your receiver functions. His question was, what do you use to solve the forward receiver function problem? I see. Uh, so in this one, because I'm using Monte Carlo searching algorithm, so I really need some fast algorithm to do the forward calculation. And uh, both the receiver functions and uh, surface wave dispersion, they are computed from Haskell matrix methodology. Uh, your needs uh, is fast. It's faster than I generate the synthetic size program and then do the uh, then do the deconvolution. It's faster, and uh, this is how I do synthetic uh, forward calculation when I do inversion. And uh, in the data, in the real data processing, I used a uh, time domain deconvolution algorithm to process the real data. OK, great. Uh, John Louie had a couple questions related to the MOHO. So okay. uh, we should we can probably do them together, but I'll read the first one first and then let you answer. Okay. Uh, John's first question was, nice constraint of crustal thickness by joint inversion. I have seen mm -hmm. a few proposals for quote unquote MOHO bubbles limited areas of crust with thickness as low as 20 kilometers. Could your results rule out the presence of a moho bubble, a moho bubble that's only 100 kilometers wide? What if there is no USRA station within the area of the bubble? 
to provide the receiver function constraints within that area of anomaly. Uh, so moho bubble means the absence of moho? Uh, it, mean, it means a very, um, a zone of very thin crust, I think is what John oh, I, I see, I see. So in terms of a very thin crust, mm, if you look at our model figure, we really see some model that has very thin moho here. Uh, I think the answer is yes, we can resolve the very thin moho. Uh, if we if we use a, a correct model space uh, in which we search for the real moho. Uh, I think once we know approximately the moho is very thin, we can we can search, uh, for example, between uh, 10 and 20 kilometers. This really happens when I do the inversion for Seal of Japan, uh, which has a very thin moho. And we have to use a model space, say, between 5 to 20 kilometers to search for the real moho. And, uh, and I think the answer is yes, we can get the moho, even if it's very thin. OK. Uh, so his second question related to the moho was, could the double moho peak at H37A, like which was in the Midcontinent Rift, mm -hmm. could that be due to 3D receiver function effects on the station in the low velocity rift. Can you rule uh, out 3D in favor of mid-crustal interface? I see, yeah, this is a good question. Uh, when we process the receiver function, we do see some 3D effect. Uh, and uh, it will generate somehow a double moho peak to us. For example, if you look at this uh, profile, and if you look at the receiver function for F38A, F38A, mm -hmm. It seems there are ma multiple moho signal there. But when I look at the raw receiver function, it's mainly from the azimuthal variation of the uh, moho signal. And for the H37A, the answer is uh, it's pretty consistent from every direction. So I think it's some signal of middle crust or discontinuity rather than a 3D effect. And uh, we have done some synthetic tests to see how big the 3D effect from, for example, the uh, 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 deeping, a deeping discontinuity, mm -hmm. or even from azimuthal anisotropy. Uh, it should not generate such large signal. And uh, they, they are divided by, I think, it's two seconds. The two signals, it's like one is N4 and four and one is N6. It's, uh, it's not uh, likely to be a 3D effect. OK. Uh, I have a couple more uh, conceptual slash uh, practical questions about the work. One okay. was from Bill Harbert. His question was, what was the total number of realizations that you used? Hundreds, thousands? And then he adds, thank you. Uh, he enjoyed your talk. I see. Uh, thanks. Uh, the Total number of realization in a typical inversion, it's uh, it's more than one hundred thousand, more than one hundred thousand uh, realizations during the inversion, and after the inversion, we only select the the result that fit our data. Usually, it's a couple of thousand models will fit our data. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, sort of a related question from Annabelle Sosa. Uh, Annabelle would like to know how computationally intense is the Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo approach to handle the 900 stations that you used? Oh, yeah. Uh, I have to use some large computers, uh, some computer with 200 cores, and it takes about several days to finish all the uh, inversion for 900 stations. And actually, here I show you, I show you a much broader region, uh, which consists about 1,400 stations in this region, and uh, it takes longer. And the good thing is, once the inversion is done, it's done. We can just keep the result, and uh, we don't have to do it again, unless we find the trouble. For example, our mother parameterization cannot cannot explain the data there. And uh, 
I think it's still acceptable. Oh. Okay. I had a question from Brandon Schmant about uh, the inversions. He was mm -hmm. uh, curious if you hold VPVS constant. Uh, okay, thanks, Brandon. And uh, the answer is yes. I I hold a constant VPVS ratio throughout the crystalline crust. And uh, okay, so for the crystalline crust, I use a VPVS ratio of one point seven five. Uh, and in the sedimentary layer, I use a VPVS ratio of two. Uh, I try to solve for the VPVS ratio in my inversion. For example, I can set the VPVS ratio as a parameter and see if I can solve for that. The answer is no, I cannot solve the VPVS ratio. The posterior distribution is like very flat. Uh, I have to use some number. And mm -hmm. uh, potentially I can use the VPVS ratio from other study, for example, the edge kappa stacking study as a prior constraint. Uh, but it's not used here in this model construction. Right. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. Just sorting through the questions. Uh, let's see. Peter Gerstoft has uh, a couple questions. Uh, okay. He, he also starts, he compliments you for the talk. And then his questions are, you use uncertainties in two ways. In showing the Moho depth, it is based on the standard deviation of the uh, MC densities, but for receiver functions, it is not a well-defined measure. What does this represent, and is it actually used? So, on the uncertainties uh, of the data, yes, uh, in a very strict uh, Bayesian frame, uh, I shouldn't use uh, uh, uncertainty of, of this one. Instead, uh, I should use the covariance matrix of the waveform. Strictly speaking, I should use that. Uh, however, I uh, it's not very easy to compute the covariance matrix of the receiver functions uh, noise. So I just use the uh, the uh, square root mean to represent the noise here. And uh, when I do the inversion, the crust thickness of the uncertainties is mainly from the wave of the receiver function and to the time of P2S uh, conversion. So if the wave is very large, the uncertainties of my resulting moho will be large. And if this uncertainty is small, the uncertainty in my model will be small. So it's just relatively uncertainty. It's the uncertainty because the uncertainty in the surface wave data could be well defined. We use iconal tomography, we have a lot of different measurements, but in research function, it's not. Yes, and uh, even the covariance matrix in surface wave, we are not sure if each data is uh, independent with each other. So we make some assumptions here. They, we think the data is independent with each other. Uh, even in receiver functions, we think the time period, the time point and two seconds is independent with time point and four seconds, but it really is not true for, uh, for waveform. Yeah, so in the future, we would like to use the covariance matrix to describe our uncertainties to the data and use the uh, covariance matrix in the inversion to get a more meaningful uncertainties. Uh, that's the future direction we are approaching. Okay, great. Um, Vaughn. Alessandro had a question uh, just about the tomography. He was curious if you could explain the main difference between the Iconal method and the Helmholtz method. I see. So I have some slide here to explain the Iconal method. Mm. The Iconal method is de 
uh, is based on the Arcano equation. Uh, for example, if we have the uh, we have the surface wave record from one station with all the other stations. Uh, you can look at the, as you can here, you can see the surface wave uh, delays with distance. And if we measure the travel time of each surface wave, we can create this travel time surface. And uh, if we take the gradient of this, of this travel time surface, uh, we can generate the, uh, we can get the information of the Velocity, the velocity of the wave propagation, as well as the wave wave number k here. I'm sorry, there are some typo here. And uh, so here is the plot of the local phase speed and the direction of propagation in this uh, from the gradient of the travel time surface. And if we if we stack a lot of those similar speed maps. This is a speed map from one central station with all the other stations. And if we pick different central station, we can generate a lot of uh, similar velocity map. We can construct a final speed map. This is for Icano tomography. It only uses the Icano equation here. And uh, theoretically, there should be another, uh, there should be another factor in this equation, which is called the Heimholtz equation, uh, because your travel time does not just depends on the local speed, it also depends on the, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it also can be, uh, you also see some uh, focusing defocusing uh, when the wave is propagating through uh, on the surface of Earth. and uh, Potentially, we can use the amplitude information to detect the focusing defocusing effect uh, to make a further correction to this icono map, uh, which is we call Heimholtz equation. Uh, however, the Heimholtz equation can only be used in earthquake data now because from ambient noise data we have no amplitude information. Uh, we are trying to uh, we are trying to uh, obtain the amplitude information, but we are not there yet. Uh, the biggest difference between Icano and uh, Heimholtz is we make the amplitude correction and uh, make the make the map uh, more sharp, uh, especially at longer periods. And for details of the Icano and the Heimholtz, please you can you can look at the Ben Ximing's paper in 2009 and 2011. And uh, there is a very detailed description to these two methods. And we think it's, these two methods are very good because it uh, not just gives us the speed map, but also the uncertainty of the speed map. Mm -hmm. Thanks. OK, great. Thank you for that. Uh, question from. Uh, Huayu Yuan has a couple questions, so I'll, I'll pair them together. Sure. The first one uh, goes back to H37A. I think uh, he's curious if that the signal that you see there could be a basin reverberation, and if that's a possibility, do you know how thick the basin is that's on top of the rift? I see. So, yes, for this station, uh, uh, in the first time we thought it's uh, basin reverberations. So. Uh, because we don't have a very good starting uh, basin map for this area, so we have to test a different uh, basin thickness range. Here I test a basin thickness from zero to six kilometers. If you look at the modeling, uh -huh. we are trying to use three kilometers thickness of sedimentary layer, trying to fit the negative wiggle here uh, and of two and a half seconds, but it's just it's not. It's still not enough, and uh, we try to go deeper, but we still cannot fit the data. And sometimes thick basins they really can generate very large vibration signals. We see them in Denver basins. And uh, however, in for this station, uh, we don't think it's basin, even, because even we use a very thick basins there, we still cannot fit the end of wiggle. 
uh, and in other situations, uh, it might be Bayesian signal. For example, uh, for I37A, that might be a Bayesian signal. We can fit that, and the amplitude is much smaller, and uh, we can see a very clear uh, step shape of receiver function here. But for H37A, we try to use base, but uh, we still cannot. Maybe we should uh, improve our uh, parameterizations in Bayesian, but, but we haven't tested them yet. Uh, yeah, this is a very good question because Bayesian structure usually uh, gives, all, gives us a lot of trouble when we're trying to fit different receiver functions. And uh, in lack of good starting Bayesian thickness map, uh, it's very hard to constrain it. Mm, thanks. Okay, great. Uh, Hua Yu's second question involves uh, profile B, B prime uh, in Montana that you were presenting. Okay. And uh, so his, his relates to uh, the estimates of the MOHO depth there. And uh, his comment initially is that active source studies in that region resolved what they interpreted as the 7.x layer, uh, which was mm -hmm. interpreted as magmatic underplaning in the, in the mid to lower crust and made the crust very thick. This was mm -hmm. also seen in earlier ambient noise and receiver function studies. Uh, right. So, but he, but in comparison, your MOHO depth is shallower than that. So his question was, uh, what's your error estimate for that era, area? And if it's um, large, it might make sense that the inversion is seeing the top of the 7x layer and not the top mm -hmm. of the mantle. I see. Uh, yeah, this is a very good question because uh, one of the goal of uh, when we develop this method is trying to find the 7x layer uh, in this region. Uh, I will show you some. Okay, just from BB prime, the crust thickness is. Uh, it's hard to it's hard to get here, and I think I have a cross thickness map. The cross thickness map for this region, there is uh, some variation here actually. It uh, varies from 40 -ish to 50 kilometers, and on BB prime, we see some very fast lower crust here, and. Uh, we try to compare our crustal thickness, especially this crustal thing here, with other independent study. We compare our result with Hirsch Gilbert's latest work uh, from receiver functions. And this is some uh, thing of the moho here, uh, a shallower moho here. And uh, when we look at the uncertainty of the crustal thickness, actually in this region, it's uh, it's not very large. It's uh, it's about three kilometers. Uh, however, in other regions, we do see some fa faster lower crust, and uh, there are some double moho there, and then we cannot fit. For example, uh, here I have a transect. Let me see. Oops. Sorry. We have a transect uh, along the Wyoming Colorado, and we try to compare our receiver function, which is blue receiver function here, and a TA station, and compare the receiver function detected from a denser array, the CD ROM array. Actually, the CD-ROM array sees some double moho. However, our TA station does not see very clearly, especially beneath Cheyenne belt. Uh, in the future, our plan is to incorporate with uh, more stations, more data, trying to get a better data of the receiver function to looking for the 7x layer in this region. And it's still under working. And uh, we, we think the question itself is very interesting, and we are working on that. Uh, thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, 
I had a question from Patrick Taylor. It was sort of a general question about uh, your thoughts on the crust beneath the Colorado Plateau. Mm -hmm. uh, the crust beneath uh, Colorado Plateau is, uh, to me, it's, uh, it's, it's mysterious. Uh, okay, let me show you some some profile here. Uh, this is your data here. I have a reserve function data actually uh, for the Crado Plateau, which is shown here T18A in Crado Plateau. And uh, there are a lot of research uh, on this region uh, that shows it's hard to find a clear local peak for Crado Plateau. And uh, some research reveals a double moho for this Colorado plateau. For example, actually our reserve function sees some amplitude in the reserve function at nine seconds. Uh, however, our uncertainty analysis shows uh, it's very uncertain about this amplitude of the vehicle. So I didn't use double moho to parameterize the model there. So basically I just get a very gradient Mm, moho for this region. And uh, gradient moho means the first, the moho is not clear, it's hard to determine the uh, depth of it. But secondly, it means the velocity in the uppermost mantle, it is relatively slower than nearby region. So I think our result uh, is coherent with some study showing there is a uh, draping of material uh, in the mantle from the crust. And if you look at the transect the long crust plateau, you can see the upper mantle is very slow and the lower crust is slightly higher. Uh, I can Now I can only make a conclusion based on my model and the data. Uh, and in the future, I hope I can do some study on the thermal structure in this region. So we can we can see the tectonic process uh, much more clearly. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, I think that was a good answer. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple more technical questions to close out uh, the questions that were submitted. The first one is from Tuna Ekin, and mm -hmm. uh, he's curious about uh, how much you can resolve about seismic anisotropy from the receiver functions in the tomography? I see. Uh, yes, that's a very good answer because uh, our group used to resolve the seismic anisotropy from surface wave because from icono tomography, we know the azimuth anisotropy very clearly. And potentially, the seismic anisotropy could be get from receiver functions. For example, if you look at the, uh, the station R11A, and uh, once we do the harmonic stripping, the A0 component could be used as the average reserve function. However, A1 and A2, they still contain some information, uh, especially the azimuth and the information. Uh, we believe some of the information is stored in A2 component and, and not just the radio reserve function, but also the transverse reserve function. And, uh, we plan to do some work to explore the signal stored in A1 and A2, uh, trying to figure out the 3D effect, uh, the enzymes and anisotropy, the deep interface uh, beneath the station uh, for US array. And uh, it's still ongoing work. And uh, we, we, we think at some time we will have the ability to resolve anisotropy and it should be stored in, in the components of A1 and A2. And I don't have an answer to uh, what's the anisotropy status for this station, but I think in the future we can we can get that information. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, and then the last question is from Min Chen, and uh, Min is curious if you can resolve 3D Q structure with your methodology. I see. Uh, right now uh, we. We cannot resolve uh, 3D Q structure uh, because, for example, our data 
which is uh, which is uh, surface wave dispersion and uh, receiver function waveform. Uh, we we tried hard to take the information stored in that, which is uh, shear wave, wave velocity and the uh, amplitude of discontinuities, and the the Q structure will be very complicated, especially for shallow structure. Uh, we have to use the amplitude of the waveform, surface waveform, uh, which by now we don't have that in our ambient noise cross correlation. And uh, I think Fan Chi Lin has done some work to resolve the Q from the earthquake surface wave. And, uh, and potentially, uh, our thread model can, can be used as a starting model to solve Q model. Uh, but right now, I, I don't have the ability to solve Q uh, structure for this region. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, well, that concludes the questions. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say to you, Wiesen, uh thanks mm -hmm. again. It was a very uh, interesting and stimulating talk. It's pretty impressive mm -hmm. the thanks, amount of thanks. observations that you've put together. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for everybody who participated uh, in in this webinar. And uh, uh, I'm, I've I appreciate a lot uh, for all those questions. And uh, and I appreciate uh, for everybody's participation. And uh, thanks to everybody. And uh, thanks to the our co-authors, uh, the people who helped us a lot uh, for this project. And uh, thank you, Andy, uh, for for the introduction for everything uh, for this webinar. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thanks. Bef before everyone goes, I just want to put in a quick plug. Uh, we said I'm going to transfer projection back over to my uh, computer. Okay. If you don't sure. Mind. Sure. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm just going to share my screen for a moment, and this is to put in a plug for a data product that has been uh, uh, under development at our data management center called the Iris Earth Model Collaboration Viewer. It's, uh, you know, with Wiesen showing all these impressive models, uh, we've been trying to accumulate a number of these in a format where they can be easily compared against each other. So instead of printing out stuff from various paper PDFs, uh, they're all put in CDF format, and then you can easily plot them against each other. So I just brought up the web page right here. So it's Iris EDU, DMS products, EMC, and then you can explore the different ways to visualize it. Uh, I, it would be wonderful one day uh, when you've completely finished North America, we send if we could mm -hmm. incorporate mm -hmm. your model into this, because I think it's one of the most impressive ones out there. But uh, in general, yeah. this is a great way to uh, get an idea for uh, different ways to look at the structure of the earth under this, uh, under this part of the world. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to put in a plug for that uh, while there were still folks around. Uh, and, uh, you know, we sent, I just want to thank you again. It was a, it was a wonderful talk. And uh, thanks. Andy. Yeah. And this will be archived and up on the website in a day or two. So, um, so yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let you all uh, go. We send, have a great rest of your day. And okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, yeah, Andy. thanks. And, and same to everyone else out there. Thanks again for coming. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Yep. Bye-bye.